TV. Fun, unique, creative individuals. As you know, some of you are probably going, Robe Hardnett, who is this guy? Well, <laughs> you know, they're like, you're not the guy that's normally opening on the show. I'm the producer of the show and the director, and normally I'm in the background, but we have a special edition, and because of the timing of it, we were not able to get a youth in, as you know, Rigel or Gigi, the normal host of the show, but hey, I'm young, and I'm fun, unique, creative individual, and we have our special guest, and that is Mr. Jeff Lieberman. Jeff is bringing on, the reason why I say special, Nina Simone. For those of you who are young, who perhaps does not know about it, I want you to do some research. You know, we're great on research. Nina Simone was a very, very innovative, young lady that in her day was a tremendous performer. Unique not only in her performance, but in her presence. So let's talk about your documentary that you're, you're bringing here, the value of it. I know it's from the beginning of her life to end. Is that correct? Yeah. So get right into it. Let's talk about it. When, first of all, when is the event? So the, the film is premiering on Thursday, June 16th. Thursday, um, it'll be right here. It's, it's, it's going to be right here on the uh, It's at the Vancouver Playhouse. Mm -hmm. um, and um, not only is it the Canadian premiere of the film, which is a, a documentary that's been playing all over the world for the last six months or so, mm -hmm. um, but Nina's guitarist, Henry Young, uh -huh. is a Vancouverite. Is that right? Yeah, and there's some really... Still here? Still here, still lives here. He's a sort of a little music legend uh, in the jazz and uh, music scene here wow. in Vancouver. And he and his quartet are going to be opening up the whole evening. Fantastic. Um, with Candace Churchill on vocals, who's a great singer. Excellent. And they're doing a whole Nina Simone music tribute to her. Excellent. Um, and then Henry's going to join me for the Q&A after the film. Oh, so yeah, cool. it's going to be a lot of really interesting Vancouver history um, tied into this film. And as a filmmaker who grew up here, wow. I was especially fascinated that Nina Simone, who you wouldn't really think of as like having anything to do with Vancouver, yeah. Yes. Was here in 1968 performing in downtown in Chinatown. Wow. For three weeks. Wow. Um, you know, at this smorgasbord, the Marco Polo, which, you know, some of your audience may remember, yes. um, was this little jazz music venue that brought in a lot of American acts. Yes. And uh, it brought Nina to Vancouver and created history with her meeting from Young. And yeah. so we're going to incorporate a lot of that into Thursday nights, uh, evening at the Playhouse. Couple of questions because you, you've said you, you've said uh, quite a few important things <laughs> in that little piece there. One starting with you yes. being from here. Yes. Uh, let's talk about that because yeah. the reason why I want to bring all of these various details to focus is because, as you know, our show is about uh, fun, unique, creative individual, highlighting on everybody's uniqueness, their ability to accomplish things. Uh, you know, a lot of you sometimes don't see themselves being able to make a leap like you've done. Mm. So let's talk about that because you're from here, yeah. you said. I grew up at 40th and Granville wow. and uh, went to high school here and really um, started training as a filmmaker in Vancouver. Um, as I was telling you just a little bit earlier, there was a show called The Complaint Department. Yes, that ran you on, you know, uh, Channel 4, Rogers, which is now Shaw. Um, and, you know, I was behind one of those monster cameras. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they still have them. Still have them. <laughs> yeah, they <like it. laughs> um, And that was, you know, some of my first exposure to this to live wow. television. Hi, I'm Kirit. Hi, I'm Tambir. And remember to be fun, unique, creative individuals. So then, um, let's just bullet point some of your accomplishments and then we'll jump right into the meeting. Sure. Why don't you give us some of those bullet points? Um, so in Los Angeles, I worked on a lot of feature films, mm -hmm. producing the behind the scenes, yeah. making of the movie that goes yeah. on HBO or on the DVD, or yeah. I'm sure on a lot of Canadian channels. Oh, yeah. So I worked on Charlie with Chocolate Factory, and Lion Witch yeah. Wardrobe, and Ratatouille, and a lot of fun movies, traveling cool. around the world with film sets. Cool. Uh, and then I sort of wanted a little more um, brain stimulation. I moved to New York. Mm -hmm. uh, I started working at CBS News. Mm -hmm. And the New York Post, and uh, really got my hands into journalism. Yeah, that was 
Very interesting. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, especially the behind scenes, the build up, the production that goes into all of that, man. Tight deadlines and yeah. you're writing and producing and getting stuff out the door twice a day. And wow. It was the Obama inauguration that started it all, and I was really there through his no whole first term. And wow. You know, know there's, <laughs> you know, Jeff, there is so much that uh, I could, we could talk about. Sure. But uh, what got you? started on this Nina Simone thing. <laughs> because, I mean, you know, there's a lot of things to pull out of the air, yeah. right? So pulling Nina Simone because she was definitely unique and in some ways she's kind of gotten lost. Yeah. So why Nina? You know, um, growing up here in Vancouver, I got into jazz music and um, I don't know if you remember, some of your viewers might remember A.B. Sound down on Seymour Street, mm -hmm. just a great big music store. And I really got into Ella Fitzgerald and um, yeah. Billy Holiday, Sarah Vaughan. Yeah, the jazz and greats. Jazz greats. And I would go to A.B. Sound or other stores and just sort of buy CDs. This is the mid-90s, you know, mid early 90s, um, of all these jazz compilations, just testing out different artists and trying to mm -hmm. figure out what I liked and who these people were. And Nina was on one of these CDs that I bought. Mm -hmm. um, Pa was the song. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow. who is this? This yeah. is so unusual. It doesn't sound like yeah. jazz, first of all. Yeah. And I'm not sure if it's a man or a woman. Right. It's French. It's beautiful. It's. Um, I was just so taken by her. Yeah. And that led me on this whole journey to like really discover who she was. Right. This is before Wikipedia, before YouTube, right. before like you could just gather all this information. So I was really figuring out Nina through her music. Right. And just loving her. You know, something inside you just says right. yes. And and, and, and and you know what's interesting about what you said? You yeah. were taken by her. For sure. In that same order, some people would listen and go, oh. Yeah. You know, she had that sort of exact effect yeah. on people. It was either is <laughs> yes. or not. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and in, in some cases, people have to grow into her because I think she was uh, like a lot of unique and iconic people ahead of the time. Sure. So we had to catch up to her. She's challenging. Yeah. She really is challenging. Very much so. Um, the film, how long did it take you to complete it? It took about three years um, to, from beginning to end. Yes. Um, maybe with a little bit more research on the front end and a little bit more of booking, promoting, and getting the film out there on the back end. But I think three years was sort of the real crux of um, writing, shooting, mm -hmm. producing, editing, fine-tuning mm -hmm. it. Did you, get, uh, did you get to interview the family? Yes. Did you get the blessing? Yes. And uh, yeah, no, that, that's that's very good. Yeah. And um, how? And, and and of course we'll see in the film. But for those who may not be able to make it, which we want you to make it, okay? Yeah. It'll be worth your while. Yes. But in any case, um, the. How complex was it? Or because because there was a lot of complexity going on yeah. uh, with the world around you from yes. from the time, from her pursuing, you know, a whole different direction than what she was sort of directed toward going. Yeah. Um, was it difficult getting through? Was was the family able to get through it? Was there that uh, you know? Yeah. G give us that insight. So Nina was one of eight children, mm -hmm. and three of her brothers and one of her sisters are still alive. Mm -hmm. And her three brothers appear in the film, oh. and each had a very unique sort of. Uh, telling of her story. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you know, they each had their own experiences right. with her growing up and, and throughout their lives. Um, Nina's youngest brother, Sam Wayman, um, is sort of a central figure in mm -hmm. this film mm -hmm. um, because not only was he uh, her brother, but he was also in her band for many years. Oh. Yeah, and he sang backup and played the organ and played piano and ended up managing her career for a little while. Oh. Uh, was that before the husband or after? Um, so. Bef actually, both. Both. Um, oh, okay. He was he was in the band um, before her husband came in to manage right, right. and continued on. 
and actually lived with them um, for a period as well mm -hmm. in sort of like a, what they call the tree house in the back of the house. Mm -hmm. And then um, after her divorce and when Nina was sort of looking for new ways to boost her career, Sam came in as the manager. Mm -hmm. So he, wow. uh, he's, he's still alive. He's said. still alive, yeah. Wow. And um, he's been appearing uh, with me at uh, a lot of the film premieres and performing. He still has a band. And oh, is that right? Yeah. What's the name of the band? Let's share some love. Uh, it's Sam mm -hmm. Wayman and the Magic Band. And there are? They're, they're based in New York. There's uh, about six of them. They Excellent. do a lot of R&B covers, a lot of Nina songs. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, they're great. So if you're picking this up on YouTube, show some love. Yeah. Uh, Sam has a beautiful song called A Brother's Love mm -hmm. that he wrote about Nina. Um, and uh, samwayman.com, you can, you can oh, listen to it. We'll, yeah. we'll have it right on the screen. <laughs> Sam Wayman. It's right here. There you go. <laughs> Very good. And you know, uh, let's, we can, let's just touch briefly because I want to give people a sense of all of the things that they will get to see sure. in, in the documentary. There was a little tumultuous uh, piece going on with the husband there. I mean, uh, yes. you know, even before the film was done, you'd kind of hear through the chitlin vine and all of that about various artists, right? So uh, give us uh, what, what they will see. Is it any of that touched on in the movies, yeah. in the documentary? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, a couple of interesting things in the film. Um, before Nina even met the husband that you're referring to, Andy mm -hmm. Stroud, um, she fell in love and married um, a, a guy by the name of Don Ross. Mm -hmm. This is in the late 50s, early 60s. Mm -hmm. um, he was white, mm -hmm. and obviously Nina was black. Yeah. And this was, you know, controversial for that period. And she was controversial already. Yeah. <laughs> not, <laughs> not adding something else on top of that. <laughs> but she was still young, you know, and it was still a very bold move from, yeah. you know, her segregated beginnings and a very Christian uh, yeah. mother who was real, really involved in the Black mm -hmm. Christian Church. Mm -hmm. um, she was shocked, by the way, of her choosing this direction in yes, music, right? Yes, absolutely. The mother, didn't yes. Didn't like it. Really didn't. Mm -hmm. she didn't. She thought of anything other than church music as the devil's music. Right, right. And uh, really encouraged the classical music, but right. didn't encourage right. uh, the pop and jazz. Right. Um, you know, so for those who know Nina as sort of the strong black militant figure, it's interesting to see this other layer of her with right. this uh, right. white husband. Right. Um, Nina also had same-sex relationships mm -hmm. with yeah. women. Yeah. Um, so that's another interesting uh, layer that mm -hmm. happens after that marriage and mm -hmm. before she meets Andy Stroud, right. um, who is this tough New York detective sergeant <laughs> um, <laughs> who was married with children when he met Nina. Uh -huh. and I didn't know that. Yeah, and told Nina he was a bank teller when they first met. Oh, um, wow. And then later revealed that this whole other life of his. Wow. But I think she was sort of attracted to his toughness and the yeah. fact that he really was into her and believed in her and right. in her music. Right. And they ended up marrying. Mm -hmm. He took over as her manager. And um, she sort of had this love-hate relationship with that idea because yeah. he was really working hard to bolster her career. Mm -hmm. But it meant a lot of work, a lot of touring, a lot of performing, a lot right. of recording. And she had a hard time with that. Right. And he also sort of was one of these guys with a very firm hand. Yeah. And that's what um, I hear. Yeah. Man, man. Yeah. And then, did am I correct that they had children? They had one daughter. One daughter. Yes. Okay. Um, they had one daughter who was born in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. And um, sort of has had, you know, a little bit of a fractured relationship with her parents. Mm -hmm. um, but has managed to establish her own career as a singer and Broadway performer. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. And she doesn't appear in my film. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, with her and I were in touch throughout the sure. film. And, and, and she essentially gave her congratulations when Excellent. the film finished. Excellent. Yeah. We're the Club Gucci Crew, and you're watching us on Novus TV. Let's talk about the activism yes. piece, because uh, multi-layered lady. Yeah. So why don't you touch on that a bit? Which I think fits nicely into your, your youth sort mm -hmm. of focus and agenda, is that, you know, here Nina Simone was, um, 
early 1960s, having this great musical career that Correct. developed almost overnight. Yeah. And wasn't anything that she really ever wanted. You right. Know, she wanted to be this classical pianist, and someone said to her, sing at some point, and she did, and people loved it, and mm -hmm. this whole music career took off. Right. And so she was a bit of a frustrated musical performer. And um, at the same time, she was in New York, and she was meeting all of these very creative individuals, um, people especially in the black community who were thinkers and intelligentsia, and really had this um, outlook on the world that Nina might not have had. Mm -hmm. And um, one of those people was Lorraine Hansberry, mm -hmm. who was a playwright and mm -hmm. wrote Raisin in the Sun. Mm -hmm. And Nina and her became close friends. And um, Nina herself says that it was really Lorraine Hansberry who pushed her into using her voice oh, as wow. a vehicle for change. Oh, wow. And um, after, yeah, after her very first Carnegie Hall concert, which was her own major achievement, Nina, right, right, uh, right. Lorraine called her and said, congratulations, but what are you doing for the movement? Mm -hmm. the civil rights movement, yeah. you know. Sometimes we need people like Lorraine yes. Hansberry to say, like, this is good, but you could be better. Right. Um, and it happened to be that that night Dr. King had been arrested in Birmingham, wow. um, you know, for a nonviolent protest. And, you know, Lorraine really saw that she needed, and all these protesters needed right. people beyond them to really right. help. And wow. that really started her on her activist. I'd like you to direct it or produce it to just summarize it and paint that picture so that people can really get a sense. And it's from your perspective. Yeah. Well, I think putting it all into perspective, like how amazing that this woman accomplished as much as she did, mm -hmm. considering the times. Mm -hmm. So here's she, how long was that? Um, Approximately. She lived to be 70. Yeah. But I'm, I'm thinking in terms of being born in 1933. Exactly. In the segregated South in a house that had no um, electricity, no plumbing. Wow. And, um, yeah, I can you know, relate. <laughs> um, at three years old, getting on the piano and starting yeah. to play and having, having the good fortune of people in her community realizing that talent yeah. and connecting her with um, a white piano teacher in this town. Yes. Who had the- What was that town? It was Tryon, North Carolina. Okay. okay. Which is on the south border, um, close to South Carolina, mm -hmm. and pretty west. Okay. Um, very close to Asheville, if people know that. Okay. Um, and having this piano teacher who really saw beyond race and mm -hmm. saw that mm -hmm. this young girl was talented and could be uh, encouraged and trained. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all through her childhood, she was encouraged with Bach and Beethoven and wow. Mozart. And really, the community saw that there was a piano prodigy in this town. Wow. And um, she went on to do a summer at Juilliard and uh, trained with a great classical pianist. Um, and really thought that she was going to go to the Curtis School of Music in Philadelphia, yeah. which would put her on the career track to be yes. this great classical pianist. She didn't get in. Yeah. Someone suggested to her that race was a factor. Yeah. Uh, in the film, we discussed that possibility, but we also discussed how gender might have also been a huge mm -hmm. uh, factor in her not getting well, in. You know, she had the double barrel yeah. scenario there. Could possibly hold it back. Yeah, a black woman from the South with yeah. little means. I mean, and um, she ended up getting a job in Atlantic City, mm -hmm. um, sort of a little resort beach area. Mm -hmm. um, the, the guy at the bar who hired her said, you either sing or you don't have a job. So she never sang before, really. She was just wow. a classical pianist. She started singing. Forced. Yeah. Someone who liked her singing said, why don't you sing this song, um, Porgy, that Billy Holiday had made right. famous, I Love right. You Porgy. Yeah. She did, it was a hit. Um, people heard it. Uh, bookers came in and said, you should be in Philadelphia, you should be in New York, you should this. Um, Bethlehem Records came in and said, we need to record you. Wow. Her first album is a hit. Corgi is all over the radio. Um, and then, you know, it sort of s it snowballs from there. She moves to New York. She's in the, the village uh, scene. Mm -hmm. She's performing regularly. The village scene. Look that up. The village scene in New York. Yeah. Greenwich Village, the village gate was yeah. primarily where she got, made her mark. Yeah. Um, she meets Andy Stroud. He really bolsters her career. Mm -hmm. um, and she's recording album after album. 
folk, pop, jazz, and then 1963 happens, as I was mentioning, yeah. Maureen Hansberry, um, there's Megger Evers, a yeah. leader in the NAACP, is shot to death on oh, song. Yeah. Four young black girls are killed yeah. in a church in Birmingham, yeah. and Nina just explodes. She says, yeah. it's too much, and um, in a fit of rage and anger, one afternoon, she writes a song, Mississippi Goddamn, mm -hmm. which is basically her crowning jewel of her mm -hmm. achievements. Mm -hmm. And in the song, she calls out entire states, yeah. Yeah. governors, yeah. churches. Getting, you know what, I'm getting chills. Just like <laughs> yeah, that. that's all right, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> really. Yeah. Uh, white people, black people, yeah. northerners, southerners. Yeah. She is not holding back. Yeah. And, you know, black people are being shot and, and, and lynched. Yeah. And she's saying, you know, I'm going to record the song. Wow. And she did, did use it at Carnegie Hall in front right. of a mostly white audience. Right. And it's, it's a hit. Yeah. And from there, she records all these amazing protest songs. Right. So many to list. But you know what I found was also interesting mm -hmm. is that so many people connect with her on different levels. Yeah. You have white men who were listening to her and mm -hmm. thought she was just so like enchanting mm -hmm. and like filled this lonely void. Mm -hmm. And then you had young black women who were listening to her and feeling inspired and yes. motivated. Yes. And, yes. Um, yes. And, and her look. Yeah. Her look at the time was strong in many ways. Yes. Not only the visual. African features, yeah. right? They were really pronounced. Yeah. And to be out front with that look was really unique. Yeah. Although she was beautiful, she was beautiful. She wasn't the classic Hollywood type that exactly. got cast in films. Exactly. And as the sixties went on, Nina's look changed. That's one of the beautiful things about the documentary yes. is you see her sort of Maybe a little homely looking in the beginning, yes, yes. a little more glamorous. Yes. And then she decides, right. I'm going to be true to my roots and who I right. really am. Right. I started dressing in these gorgeous African right. inspired outfits, jewelry, right. hair, makeup. Right. Um, it's gorgeous. So, and go a, ahead. A brave, a brave, courageous move on yeah. that part. I mean, this just wasn't very few black women. Yeah. And, and, and I hesitate to say no black men um, yeah. were going on the Merv Griffin show, you know, yes. which was a very plastic white environment yeah. Yeah. dressed in beautiful native yeah. African attire, especially when you're, you're right. not coming from Africa. You're, you're right. an American woman. Because even though uh, Mohammed went on there, mm -hmm. on Merv, I remember seeing, uh, he had on a suit. Yeah. Right? It wasn't an African garb. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, African. Uh, um, uh, look yeah. per se. So yeah, you're right. I, I hadn't thought about that. So a lot that they will see yeah. is it uh, when the documentary moves on. How will people be able to partake in uh, things that are going on there? Like, of course, they can still buy her music. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the film. The film, um, if they don't, or if they aren't able to join us on Thursday night at the Playhouse, um, which you want to, you, which you do want to, because not only is it amazing to see it on the big screen mm -hmm. and to partake in a venue like the Playhouse, it's, I'm very, very proud that it's at one of the biggest mm -hmm. theaters in the city um, to see the film on the big screen and to hear Nina's music, mm -hmm. you know, reverberate through the whole. Um, Theaters right. is amazing, and to hear the musical tribute, and to sort of be able to really, the film brings up a lot of questions, as mm -hmm. you know, just the discussion does. To be able to ask your questions to myself and to Henry, right. I think will be a really interesting experience. Unusual experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the film's available on DVD as mm -hmm. well. Uh, then go to amazingnina.com to purchase mm -hmm. it. Right here. Right yeah. Here. Uh, it's also being sold at Red Cat Records mm -hmm. on Main Street, if people want to drop by yes, there. Yes, yes. Main and 27th. Okay. We want Club Fuji to always be on the cutting edge and to inspire you. I think Jeff's story is very, very, very inspiring of uh, him coming from here, uh, native and going out and now producing one of the major icons within the music industry. That is a major accomplishment. So, uh, and if I may, yes, just go right ahead. 
uh, presented me such a nice compliment. Yes. I want to give you and your audience a small gift as well. Okay. Um, for those who do want to join us on Thursday, mm -hmm. um, we're going to offer you a special discount code, which we're going to put up on the screen. Um, so you can go to amazingnina.com, and uh, this, this code here will give you a discount off of tickets, um, since you're a good friend of Rave's and the show. Um, there you we go. We want to uh, ensure that uh, every ticket is affordable. Yes. And um, the, the tickets are $50 for the orchestra and 35 for the balcony, and the discount gives you a nice little uh, Excellent. So it gives you a nice little discount off of that. Excellent. So see, being a part of the Club Fuji.tv network has its advantages. Yes. So there you go. Jeff. Thank you so much. I want to thank you so much. My pleasure. And uh, I'm Robe Hartnett. Again, you normally don't see me, but I'm here today. It is the real, it is the flesh, and I want you to remember to be fun, unique, creative, individual. I'm Robe Hardinat. I'm out of here.